This lecture is an introduction to Paul's letter to the Romans. It's not a full-blown introduction. That kind of material can be covered well in an introduction to the New Testament or in uh, the introductions to good commentaries on Romans. Rather, this involves a few comments that I want to make, uh, particularly about certain issues as we come to the beginning of a study of Romans. At the beginning of a study of Romans, it's interesting to point out how significant Romans has been in the life of some key people. So, for example, we might start with Augustine in the summer of 386. He records in his uh, Confessions that he came to faith by uh, reading Romans. He says that uh, he sat weeping in the garden of his friend, Alepius, almost persuaded to begin a new life, yet lacking the final resolution to break with the old. As he sat, he heard a child singing in a neighboring house, Take up and read. Taking up the scroll which lay at his friend's side, he let his eyes rest on the words, Not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof, which is a quote from Romans 13, 13b through 14. Then Augustine says that no further word I read, he tells us, nor had I any need. Instantly at the end of this sentence, a clear light flooded my heart and all the darkness of doubt vanished. And so uh, from Romans 13, Augustine felt a conviction from God of his past uh, wild, sinful, uh, sexual uh, profligacy, his life. And so he was converted. Martin Luther, in his introduction to his lectures on Romans, says this, There have always been some among the Jews and the Gentiles who believed it to be sufficient if they possessed virtue and knowledge not of the kind that is outwardly uh, put on, but that which is inward and comes from the heart. And yet they could not refrain from being inwardly pleased with themselves and to praise themselves in their heart as righteous and good men. Of such, the apostle says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Romans 1.22 But here... Just the opposite shall be taught. For in the church, we must not merely see to it that our righteousness and wisdom, which are not worth anything, are neither upheld by our own sense of glory nor extolled by the good opinion of others, but rather we must take pains that they are destroyed and plucked up from our own complacent inner feelings. For God does not want to save us by our own, but by an extraneous righteousness which does not originate in ourselves, but comes to us from beyond ourselves, which does not arise on our earth, but comes from heaven. Now in that you can hear some of Luther's interpretations, and these are interpretations that have been challenged by the new perspective on Paul. Uh, you may remember that Luther was a monk who was even cautioned uh, by his uh, superior not to be so hard on himself. And Luther seemed to be driven by a desire to be righteous before a righteous God. And by righteous God, he understood an angry, wrathful God who held you to account. And he realized his own weakness and sinfulness. And so he reads Romans as a message to himself as well as to, to others. He says, among all Jews and Gentiles, there are those who believe that they possess sufficient virtue and knowledge and uh, he, he sees Romans as a challenge to to the pride that you can attain a righteousness of your own then uh, John Calvin has this to say uh, if we understand this epistle we have a passage open to us to the understanding of the whole of scripture and Romans does seem to be one of the key books of the Bible uh, for, to which we return again and again for our Christian theology. 
And John Wesley, on the 24th of May, 1738, says this about his own conversion. He says that he went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street where one was reading Luther's preface to the Epistle to the Romans. Imagine having that as your Bible study. But uh, continuing with Wesley, he says, After a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did, tr I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for my salvation, and an assurance was given me that he had taken my sins away, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Here we see, uh, again, a personal reading of Romans. The message is for the individual. And this is going to be challenged in some readings of Romans uh, that we will encounter. But I think that it's not wrong to see this as long as we see it in light of Paul's major argument, which is broader than just the individual. He's working larger themes than personal salvation in Romans, but they do have implications for the personal. And so both uh, in terms of personal conversions and in terms of an understanding of Christian theology itself, Romans has been seen to be important by major figures such as these and others in the history of the church. The question arises, where do we locate this letter of Romans in the life and ministry of Paul? And so I want to say a few things about chronology and as I lead up to answer that question. There is evidence that comes to us from the book of Acts and then also from Paul's letters. And you'll notice from the column on the right that in particular Galatians 1 and all the way up through chapter 2, verse 1, is very helpful for us to learn something of Paul's life uh, from Paul's own account up until the time he writes Galatians, which seems to be the first letter that he wrote that is in uh, the canon. So that doesn't help us with a full description of Paul's life, but it uh, does cover a number of years. Here Paul then gives us his most extensive discussion at any point of dates in his ministry. And as this table shows, Paul has lived either 14 or 17 years as a Christian when he writes to the Galatian churches. Now why do we say 14 or 17 years? That's because in Galatians 2.1, Paul says, after 14 years... But he's already described certain other things. For example, in Galatians 1.17, a reference to three years. So the question then is, do we take the 14 years as beginning at the same point as the three years at the beginning of Paul's Christian life? And, or, or do we uh, add them together and, and get 17 years? And that seems to be quite possible. If the letter, Galatians, is written to the northern Galatia churches, then it would be after the second missionary journey. Now, very quickly, uh, Galatia is a Roman province, but it's also a territory. And it's in pr what would be present-day Turkey. So, uh, if it refers to a territory, an, an area, a region... Uh, that's where the Galatian people live. They had migrated there from Gaul, and so it's called Galatia. Uh, but the Roman province was larger than where the Galatian people lived and included territories in the south. And in fact, what's called Pisidian Antioch is uh, a city, a major city, that comes to be included in the province of Galatia because the boundaries wrap around the city and uh, area around the city. And so uh, it's a very strangely drawn uh, province. 
So the question then becomes, uh, is Paul writing to the Galatians in the north or to people who might not be Galatian, but they are in the province of Galatia? Now, from the book of Acts, we learn that Paul uh, ministered on his so-called first missionary journey to uh, the southern part, but not to the Galatian people in the north, if we take the account as a full account. And then in the second missionary journey, the account is just vague enough that we might say that we don't know for sure if he ever went in to the territory in the north of the province of Galatia. So uh, it's possible. And if you, if you want to identify the recipients of the letter of Paul to the Galatians, then you need to, uh, to with these people in the north, then you need to say the letters later, it, hap it was written uh, after the second missionary journey. So uh, the dating uh, is tied up with who the Galatian people were. Now, if we um, bring in Acts 15 into the discussion, then we've got the question of, does Galatians uh, somehow capture the thought of the decision of the council uh, in Jerusalem recorded in Acts 15 without actually referring to the letter? And how could Paul possibly not refer to the letter when he's dealing with what seems to be the same issue? And so that's led a number of people to say that it seems as if Paul's writing uh, prior to Acts 15 when he writes to the, to the Galatians. And that then would also support a Southern Galatia theory. Um, now, in terms of dates, we know that Paul was not a Christian when Jesus was crucified. And, and the, the time, the date of Jesus' crucifixion uh, has increasingly been identified in scholarship in our time to A.D. 30. We used to say A.D. 30 or 33. It seems as if it was A.D. 30. And going back to the previous slide, we've got 14 years at the very least to add on to 30. That would take us up to the year 44. Or possibly 17 years, which would take us to 47 now, it could be that there's time after what Paul describes in Galatians 1 and, and uh, chapter 2, verse 1. And so we don't have absolute certainty about numbers of years and so forth. But we are talking about what's impossible uh, as well as what's possible. And what's impossible is that the letter was written to the Galatian church prior to, the, to A.D. 44. There are all sorts of other issues that come into play in discussing the date of Paul's letters. Uh, one of those is to work backwards, because we know when Gallio was uh, proconsul in Corinth, where Paul uh, encountered him on his second missionary journey, and uh, that was uh, in uh, about 51 AD. So, so the second missionary journey is taking place um, at that time, uh, starting undoubtedly a bit earlier because Paul's accomplished quite a bit by the time he gets to Corinth. And he also stays there uh, for a year and a half. Um, so the question then is, uh, when, how much earlier should we go to look back to when the first missionary journey took place. And clearly now we're moving back into the 40s. So many scholars, um, so for example, Eckhart Schnabel in his book, Paul the Missionary, have thought that we can specify the Jerusalem Council to the year 48. And this is all coming together. It all f seems to fit. We might be off a year or two, but now what we're really doing is we're identifying the year of Paul writing to the Galatian church on the issues of uh, righteousness and justification um, that we also find in Paul's letter to the Romans. But he's writing that letter in about um, A.D. 47 
or 48, just before the council. Now, why does any of this matter as we begin our study with Romans? First, Paul's missionary work before what we often refer to as his first missionary journey involved actually 15 years of ministry already uh, in Damascus, in Arabia, in uh, uh, Tarsus, in, in uh, Syria and Cilicia, um, and then also uh, in Antioch itself, which is back in Syria, but it is um, uh, about a two-year ministry that he has there, and it's from there that he and Barnabas and Mark are sent off on their first missionary journey. This is interesting because this shows that Paul has been engaged in mission work with Jews and Gentiles for 15 years before we really pick up his story, either in the book of Acts or in his letters. And then secondly, we're, um, uh, we, by identifying a date of about 47 or 48, we realize that Galatians is Paul's first letter, and it is written probably about 10 years before he writes Romans. And yet, some of what he writes in Romans is um, the, the same theology and the same references to the Old Testament are given as, as proof, particularly Abraham could be mentioned here, um, his understanding of the law and so forth. Paul is consistent in his theological teaching on these matters over many years. Now what about Romans itself? Paul writes Romans just before going to Jerusalem, we learn. And this appears to be in the mid-50s. It may be as early as 54 or 55, and perhaps as late as 57, which is a date many people give for the writing of Romans. Gert Ludemann from Germany has written about Paul in chronology, and he's one of the... According to a scholar by the name of A.J.M. Wedderburn, who wrote a book uh, called The Reason for Romans, the Jews had recently returned to Rome, and this has become a point that many people um, make. The Jews had recently returned to Rome. There was an edict of Claudius, the emperor, that expelled the Jews from Rome in 49 um, or 50. And Claudius uh, dies in 54. So this is where we get the earliest date for Romans, when Nero takes the place as emperor from Claudius in 54. And the Jews are allowed by Nero to return to Rome. Now we know from uh, the book of Acts about Priscilla and Aquila, and we also know from Romans chapter 16 that Priscilla and Aquila whom Paul met in Corinth first, are now in Rome. Chapter 16, verse 3. Um, from chapter 1, verse 10 in Romans, we learn from Paul that he had prayed to be able by God's will to see the Christians in Rome uh, for some time. And that may also relate to this expulsion of Jews from Rome. It's possible that one reason Paul didn't visit Rome earlier was that he couldn't. The Jews had been expelled, and then there were other pressing matters on him, too, so that he uh, can't plan his trip until uh, 57, but he has still something else to do, and that's go to Jerusalem before he comes on to Rome to visit them and exchange spiritual gifts with them. So Wedderburn concludes that the primary issue in the church, the issue that Paul's addressing, has to do with the relationship between Jews and Gentiles in the Roman church. You can imagine a situation where perhaps the church was started by Jewish uh, believers, 
Um, there's every reason to believe that. We'll go into that evidence in a bit. Uh, and then Gentiles quickly come into the church as well, and it's a mixed church. But then the Jews, and some of them being key people who know the scriptures, uh, are expelled, and you only have a Gentile church left. And then the Jews return, and this creates uh, various kinds of potential conflict uh, between uh, Gentiles and Jews in the church. And so this is understood then to be one of the occasions for Paul writing this letter to the Romans. The, what backs that up is the actual content of the letter itself. And one of the things we find in, in Romans chapter 14, verses 2 and following, and verses 14 and following, is that there's an issue between the strong and the weak over food. And then secondly, over holy days in chapter 14, verses 5 and 6. And all of this has to do with Jewish food and Jewish holy days that are viewed differently from the Gentiles. The climax of the book of Romans in uh, chapter 15, verses 1 through 9, before, before we end up with concluding remarks, uh, it says this, We who are strong ought to put up with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us must please our neighbor for the good purpose of building up the neighbor. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, so that by steadfastness and by the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, so that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome one another, therefore, just as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the circumcised on behalf of the truth of God, in order that he might confirm the promises given to the patriarchs, and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy." So the uh, issue comes to the point at the end of, given the presence of Jews in the church and the issue uh, having something to do with Jews and Jewish teaching around the law and righteousness and so forth uh, in the book of Romans, we do need to note something about Jews in Rome. And if you look at this map, uh, you see the Tiber River snaking its way uh, just to the left of the center. And at its further, furthest eastern part, where it takes a hard, hard turn right in the middle of the map, um, if you just go east of that, you, come, you can see, for example, the Palatine Mount there. And that is the central region. This is where you would find the forum. This is where you find a lot of things built here. And uh, in fact, just above that, you can see um, forum written on the map, F-O-R. There's also uh, where those roads meet, where I'm pointing to, if you take the forum down and you see the a horseshoe, uh, of the in the road and the word way written there that's about where the Colosseum is going to be constructed at a later time and this is therefore central Rome this is where all the activity is but the Jews are to be found on the west side of the Tiber Augustus Caesar who dies in uh, AD 14 uh, divided the regions of the city up into 14, and this was the 14th district on the west side of the Tiber. And that is where most of the Jews and the Syrians in Rome lived. That was their area. And therefore, undoubtedly, this is 
the uh, major area of uh, the Christian church in Rome in its earliest times. Now, Jews uh, are in Rome for some time before all of this, and our earliest record points to them being present in Rome uh, as early as around 139 B.C. Um, When some uh, Jews were compelled to go back to their own homes from the city. So there we also learn that uh, there's a long history of throwing Jews out of Rome. Again, the Emperor Pompey, who was uh, um, a rival to uh, the the authority of Julius Caesar, uh, in 62 BC, the General Pompey brought back many Jewish captives to Rome. And then many of them, we learn, were freed. The Jews were granted many ancestral rights, including the right to assemble in the 40s BC by Julius Caesar. We learn from Josephus as well as Suetonius. Cicero, the great orator uh, in Rome, refers to large crowds or a large crowd of Jews uh, that gathered uh, around a certain trial of someone named Flaccus. Now, from that simple statement, we learn that there are lots of Jews in Rome. And Horace says that there were many Jews in Rome. Josephus actually says that over 8,000 Roman Jews supported an embassy from Judea in 4 BC to petition against uh, one of the three sons of Herod the Great, Archelaus, uh, rule of Judea. And as you know, Archelaus did not live as emperor very long because he was such a bad ruler. Um, uh, Amazingly, a bad ruler was not allowed to continue to be a bad ruler, at least in this case. And he was uh, replaced by Roman procurators, one of whom eventually was named uh, Pilate. The Jewish catacombs, underground tunneling in the city, uh, where... uh, Christians hid um, has inscriptions that reveal 10 to 13 synagogues in Rome in the first century AD. And I should say the, syn- the, the catacombs are not only f- dug by Christians, but uh, obviously also here by Jews. According to um, a scholar there by the name of Leon, there were about 40,000 to 50,000 Jews in Rome in the first century A.D., mostly slaves and freedmen. The earliest remains of a synagogue in Europe have been found in a port city by the name of Ostia, which is the port city for the city of Rome. It lies about 19 miles southwest of Rome, just as the Tiber enters the sea. Here we find, then, Jews present. And here are some pictures of the remains uh, of this synagogue. Now, the issue that is debated is whether or not this building was a building, uh, was built as a synagogue in the first place, or whether it became a synagogue. And we do know that this building has gone under uh, change over time. So the question is, um, what was really going on in the time of Paul? Uh, An interesting question. It does seem to have been built, though, uh, during the time of the emperor Claudius. Remember the emperor who expelled Jews from Rome in A.D. 49. Thus, it's possible that Paul would have met Jews from this synagogue. And it is possible that Paul himself might have spoken here. Now, I'm not saying he spoke here when he was a prisoner in Rome. But there is uh, some possibility that he had some freedom and wasn't always only a prisoner in Rome if there are two 
imprisonments for Rome, uh, for, for Paul in Rome. Uh, Christians likely emerged from within these Jewish communities with their synagogues all over the Roman Empire, as we read in the book of Acts. We see that was the pattern of early Christian evangelism to begin with the Jews in the synagogues and to remain there as long as they could. Paul uh, also attests to this in 2 Corinthians 11.24. He is flogged uh, in uh, Jewish synagogues. There were many God-fearers. The um, name applies to Gentiles who attached themselves to the synagogues. Gentiles were attracted to Judaism and uh, then would be found in the synagogues. As we hear from various authors, both Jewish, like Josephus and Philo, and from uh, Gentile authors, non-Christian authors, like Plutarch and Cicero and Juvenal and Cassius and Suetonius and Horace as well, all referring to um, Gentiles becoming associated as God-fearers with the synagogue. Uh, Priscilla and Aquila were Christian Jews from Rome, already noted in the book of Acts uh, uh, chapter 18, Paul associates with them very quickly in Corinth because they're of the same trade and also Jews, and then they also become Christians and they become significant Christians. Uh, there are also two people who pop up in Ephesus, and then when Paul writes to the Romans, they're now back in Rome, able to return. Note that Paul was able to assume a knowledge of the Old Testament and uh, that the Greek Septuagint would have been um, the book already prepared for Gentile converts, and undoubtedly for many of the Jews living in Rome as well, that the Septuagint would have been used. Now, according to James Dunn in his commentary on Romans, only later in Nero's reign, around about A.D. 64, were Christians distinguished from Jews. And it's at this time, uh, too, that Christians become persecuted and uh, Nero himself has many Christians put to death, uh, having blamed them for a fire in Rome. We find, alas, some very uh, negative statements about Jews, even at this time uh, in the history of Europe. And these come from pagan authors. Uh, Cicero calls Judaism a barbaric superstition. Uh, inimical to all that is Roman. Seneca s speaks of customs of this accursed race that have gained such influence that they are now received throughout the world. The vanquished have given laws to their victors. Pliny the Elder uh, in the first century designated the Jews as a race remarkable for their contempt for the divine powers. Another Roman writer, Marshall, says the lecheries of circumcised Jews, speaks of the lecheries of circumcised Jews. And Tacitus, the historian, says the Jews regard as profane all that we hold as sacred and permit all that we abhor. Here's a group of people that stand out so much from the rest of society that they become the object of scorn and hostility. Now, Christians then are associated with this at first. And as they become distinguished from Judaism, they nevertheless become the object of even greater contempt. Why greater? Because they have not only uh, taken their roots from this religion, but they are also made up increasingly of Gentiles who have gone over to this 
barbaric superstition and added some of their own. And some of their own uh, views would have been directly contrary to the Roman imperial religion, which could call someone like Caesar Lord and Savior and Son of God. That language Christians absolutely refuse to use of anyone but Jesus Christ. Now, regarding uh, Christians in Rome further, James Dunn, in his commentary on Romans, uh, says that uh, a look at Romans 16 suggests that there were many slaves or freedmen in the church. Now, I think we can overstate our confidence in some of these things. What we should say is there's definite evidence of this. And by his calculations, 14 of the 24 names are common slave names uh, in Romans 16. Uh, the Christians, we know, would have met in houses at different places uh, around the city. Um, Pris Prisca and Aquila, Romans 16, um, there have people meeting in their house. Also Aristobulus and Narcissus, chapter 16, verses 10 through 11, are mentioned. Due to the expulsion of Jews in AD 49, most house churches then would have become Gentile homes or else they would have met elsewhere um, as Gentile congregations. And yet with the return of Jews, then we could have had uh, not only mixed congregations, but perhaps Jews starting up new churches in their homes, uh, perhaps because of where they lived rather than any intentional division. But this could explain some of the issues that are going on in Romans. Dunn speculates that the Jewish Christians are well toward developing a separate identity when Paul writes Romans, since Jewish pressure over issues like circumcision are absent from the debate or discussion in, uh, in the book, whereas they were present in Paul's letter to the Galatians.